we talk about the things we see as being relevant factors uh, in the political cycle, in the electoral landscape of the state, with an intention of helping business people understand what's uh, likely to happen in a particular election. Uh, today's program, we've uh, affectionately dubbed Pundit Palooza, had a lot of conversation with folks over the past couple of years about the value proposition of the programming we do, where we bring in a variety of folks to talk about from their perspective what they see being the relevant factors in a particular election. And so we decided to do that on steroids. And so we brought in nine folks today to talk in lightning fashion in 10 minutes to provide their insights into what the March 15th primaries mean, what the June 7th primaries are likely to produce. Um, uh, and uh, look a little bit forward to the November elections to talk a little bit about what they think the factors are that are relevant to uh, North Carolina in, the, in this presidential election cycle. After each person speaks, we will put up on the screen this. If you want to go ahead and send a text, uh, that, that message to the text number 22333, uh, T-H-E-N-C-F-R-E-E-E-N-T-920, go ahead and text that. Uh, after each... Uh, yeah, I know, you have to pay to get a shorter one, so <laughs> it's the opposite of real life, I guess. Um, so you, you will have an opportunity after each pundit to uh, express your opinion as to whether you feel what they said was correct, that it's probable, but you're not certain it's absolutely uh, likely, and then that you think what they said was absolutely wrong. So when uh, each of the pundits is concluded, we'll put this back up and you'll see the results in real time, and you'll vote either A, B, or C based on what you heard uh, that particular pundit uh, say. Tim, you'll introduce the first pundit. I guess being the MC, you should probably do that, right? Yeah, why not? All right, thank you, Tim. Thanks, Joe. Thank you all. It's uh, an honor to be here, as always. Uh, really an easy job for these folks today. I mean, I don't know about you, but a year ago today, I totally guessed that Donald Trump would be ahead in the presidential race and that North Carolina would be involved in a culture war nationally over things like transgender bathroom issues and uh, LGBT rights. Uh, so these guys really should have it pretty easy. They're going to give you sort of an overview about the mood of voters in North Carolina uh, and what we saw on March 15th, whether that tells us anything about November and perhaps some thoughts on who might do well in races here in North Carolina in November. Our, our first uh, pundit today is Mr. Mark Banker. He's a multimedia investigative reporter at WRIL. He's been there since 2012. Before that, he was at the Greensboro News and Record, a longtime uh, investigative reporter and political reporter. I've worked with him quite a bit and admire uh, what Mark does on a daily basis. So everybody, Mark Binker. So the first thing I wrote down to say, my uh, wrote down to say was thank you, Joe, with sarcasm all around it. Um, we're dealing in a year with an earlier than usual primary, except for Congress and the Supreme Court, which are later than usual. And by the way, we'll get a trial about the Supreme Court election before six of sitting Supreme Court justices that year. That's great. Uh, then Trump is a front runner. A man so you know catastrophically ignorant of the last 40 years of political cycle that he managed to hack off both sides of the abortion debate in the same day in the same statement, um, and you know a year in which the Republican Party seems bent on sort of destroying itself from the inside, and the Democratic Party still has the workplace safety sign 311 days since, since not being an unbearable burden to our candidates running. So. Um, <laughs> A year in which we know the basic meters of our profession polling aren't working real great for the past few years and, and aren't getting any better right now just because people aren't answering the darn phone anymore. 22 people running in North Carolina, 13, is that about right? Uh-huh, and then should we talk about bathrooms and backlash? Um, this is like playing chess on a backgammon board with Parcheesi tokens using the strict rules of Scrabble. <laughs> <coughs> so I'm gonna tell you exactly what's gonna happen, right? All right, uh, mood of voters, angry. Everybody's angry about something. It used to be you go to a campaign rally and it was like, oh, I love so-and-so, oh, I love so-and-so. No, you go to a Trump rally. I'm mad about this, so I'm with Trump. I, you go to a Clinton rally. I'm mad about this, so I'm, I'm with the Anger is the prevailing mood of the day. Um, they might be angry about the economy, they might be angry about the patriarchy, the matriarchy, the oligarchy, whatever you got, they're angry at some archy or another. Um, the good news, I guess, for political people is anger motivates people better than happiness. So if you have uh, you know, an a angry electorate, you should expect your turnout in November to be 
good. So uh, I, I think one thing I look at, look forward to November 8th, it's November 8th, right? November 8th, big turnout because everybody's gonna be angry. Now, what the results of that will be, um, big issues, economy. I think that we're, we're gonna test the Carolina comeback, not as a thing, whether it's real or not, but whether people are feeling it and whether it's a good line to use. Um, because the, the whole sort of line on Governor McCrory, we, we've been part of the Carolina comeback, Republicans have turned the state around. Whether you're gonna vote for the governor and presumably for other offices on the ballot is gonna come down, do you believe that? Do you, do you feel it? Um, and if you're angry and you're turning out, you might not be feeling it, I don't know. Um, but the Hagen race. And, and I thought the Hagen race was all gonna be about economy and education right up until about five, six weeks out, and then it was about you know, Ebola and you know, world events. Uh, so right now, I think it's all about the economy, it's all about teacher pay, all about you know, are you feeling good about things, but there's always that chance for a last second, and everything we thought the election was gonna be about goes away. Um, I will say, I think sh voters historically have short attention spans, so I don't know if this HB2 issue is going to last into November as a salient thing driving voters. You know, obviously if we were having an election in two weeks, it would be kind of front and center. Uh, what you wonder about now is, you know, are, are people still gonna hold on to that? And obviously so, some activists will, and, and some people who, to whom the issue is near and dear will. I think the biggest impact that may have is kind of on into the future on fundraising. I would be very surprised if when we see second quarter fundraising reports from the Cooper campaign and maybe from the McCrory campaign, if we don't see uh, they had really good weeks after raising money off of a really volatile issue. What do the primaries mean? Meh, Sh little shruggy guy. Um, both parties kind of went with central casting, which is interesting because it's sort of a you know, anti-incumbent, mad at the establishment sort of year, and everybody sort of ran home to, to mommy on the, on, the, on the candidates. You know, they're the candidates you expected to see, whether it be Deborah Ross or, you know, on down the ballot, are the ones that you got. There were a few kind of close calls in legislative races, but both parties have decided to play in a dynamic, kinetic, unexpected environment with the same old chessboard. So maybe the degree of certainty that we're lent here is in the candidates themselves. Um, and then you ask to look forward to, what does Trump mean? If Trump's the nominee, say hello to President Clinton. That's my, my you know, if I, if I were going to Vegas and betting something, I, I, I don't think he does well for candidates on down the ballot. Um, in the U.S. Senate race, I, you know, Ross is in sort of the Hagan position when she ran against Dole. You know, did Hagen ran, run a particularly brilliant campaign against Elizabeth Dole? Not really, but she was the reasonable vessel there to be on the receiving end of uh, uh, anti-Republican backlash. So Rep Representative Ross is in the position to be the reasonable alternative to Richard Burr if all heck breaks loose and the tide flows against the Republicans. Um, other than that, she has a really uphill battle. Um, and then General Assembly, what's gonna happen with the General Assembly? Probably still Republican control, maybe a few less seats, maybe some trouble in um, suburban districts. You saw races like uh, Representative Jeter down near Mecklenburg County, down Mecklenburg County, where he won his primary by a really skinny margin. I'm going to call him landslide from here on out for the rest of the session. Um, but you know, maybe that's a portent of trouble. But other than that, you know, it's still going to be a Republican legislature unless something really drastically turns. So, did I make my 10 minutes? I think you did. You still have three minutes, so. No, I see. I see. I, I see my time to the gentleman from News 14. So who's going to win the governor's race? <laughs> <laughs> nah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mike. Journalists like to squirm when you ask them to make predictions on elections, so we don't like to do that. So. Uh, our next uh, pundit is Dr. Andy Taylor. He's a political science professor at NC State University. This is like the greatest hits of guests on our show. Joe has such a nice wide variety here. So uh, Dr. Andy Taylor, everyone. I, I, I didn't realize I was second, but I guess I'm ready. Um, 
and I've eaten. And I also didn't realize this was a competition. So I, when I, by the way, what does what WTF mean, Joe? <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, so I thought, you know, we were trying to complement each other, and so I thought, well, what's my comparative advantage against these guys? And I was going to talk about the congressional races. Uh, so I was furiously <laughs> writing other things down. But let me t do what I was originally going to do in my first five minutes, and then my extemporized remarks in the uh, second five minutes, if that's okay. Because I was really was going to focus on the congressional races. Um, as I said, because I thought that was kind of my comparative advantage as a, as a Congress guy, and I didn't think anybody else would be particularly interested in them on the panel. So as you all know, we now have a um, US House uh, primary on June 7th because we've had our districts uh, uh, redrawn after, uh, after a successful court challenge. And if you've looked at the maps, um, if you've had a chance to look at the map uh, and compare it to the previous map, it really looks largely the same. Uh, with two sort of basic differences. One, one would be that the districts do look a little bit more kind of compact and perhaps sort of more natural, um, just geographically. And the second is that the 13th district, and, 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 and they've been moved slightly westward, and the second is that the 13th district is completely different um, because the 13th district has been, uh, its eastern part, the part that comes into our immediate area here has been, has been changed. And so that... Uh, get, and the fact that um, the districts will have new voters in them. Uh, so every incumbent who is running uh, is in, in their original district uh, is going to have new voters anyway, has seemed to have created what uh, would be sort of sleepy races, um, given the old plan, uh, given the fact that it's a presidential election year, uh, a new lease of life. And so we have, I, I think, a really sort of interesting um, landscape in the, in the congressional races now. Um, so there are going to be some, uh, but this is particularly so on the Republican side, of course. Um, uh, just about all of the Republican uh, races now are going to be more competitive, with the exception of the 7th Congressional mm -hmm. District, because David Rouse has sort of lost his challenger. Uh, this, uh, the, the two that obviously come immediately to mind are the 13th and the 2nd. Um, the, the 13th, because it, it is essentially a new district. It, that, it, it is all, uh, really a brand new district. It's almost like complete redistricting with regards to the 13th. And there are, I think, I counted 16 Republican candidates who have... 17. So 17 who have, who have, who have filed, um, including three or four uh, sitting or former state legislators and people like uh, Vernon Robinson and Jim Snyder, who aren't state legislators, but are people who have run um, frequently uh, for, for office, federal office before, and, and will be well known. So it's going to be really interesting, and given the fact that there won't be any uh, uh, primaries further up the ballot, who knows who's going to show up? Um, uh, and, and it really is almost basically a lottery. And then the third, the, the second district, of course, is going to be really interesting because um, you have two incumbent members of the U.S. House of Representatives running a, up against e each other in Renee Almers and George Holding, and then you have uh, Greg Brannon, who's running again. Um, just worked out for him that he was able to run for two federal offices uh, in uh, in the same year, um, uh, and 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 obviously is not not small fry himself. So we've got a real sort of battle of heavyweights um, uh, in the second in the new con second congressional districts and. And we could talk, uh, and 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 each of them, I think, uh, occupies a certain sort of s space in Republican, uh, the way Republicans are thinking at the moment, and and it's going to be a question of, of who's able to uh, to get people out. And it'll be very interesting to see how that evolves. Um, even on the Democratic side, the 12th congressional district race now is really, you know, Elmer Adams has some uh, significant uh, opposition. Uh, three sitting, one former state legislator. So even on the Democratic side, the, the redrawing and the reconstitution of the congressional districts have, have created um, some interesting competition. All right, so then uh, that's what I was going to... I was going to talk more about that for over ten minutes, but I truncated into five because now I have to make predictions. So what were some of the things? Okay, uh, at the, at the Mark said that the, is, the voters are angry... Um, well done, Mark. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, but uh, the way one of the interesting sorry I can resist that. Uh, um, 
one of the interesting ways of looking at the electorate, I think, and particularly trying to think about the Trump and Sanders phenomena, uh, or phenomenon, because I'm putting it into one here, this year, is to think in terms of um, the, the electorate, not just sort of angry, but what the kind of groups demographically, economically, uh, ideologically that have been attracted to. And there's a lot of crossover. You hear a lot of this from in focus groups and stuff. People with second choice after Trump would be Sanders, or they don't know who they would vote for in a Sanders-Trump pr uh, presidential election. And for most people who, see, who think about these two people on an, an, a, a sort of conventional ideological spatial model, would say they're miles apart. Uh, but, but people are seeing commonalities. And I think a lot of it comes down to um, the, the idea of uh, Peggy Noonan uh, in, a, in a Wall Street Journal uh, column on Saturday talked about people being thinking of themselves as being protected or unprotected. Um, I like to think some along those lines as well, and, some, and, and I've heard others talk about it uh, in these terms. I like to talk about it as sort of winners of globalization versus losers of globalization on one side rather than the other. And, and obviously, the Trump Sanders people are, consider themselves sort of losers or, uh, or unprotected. Unprote the, the macroeconomic indicators, even given the jobs number this morning, are pretty good. And yet people feel that themselves, uh, they feel unsafe, they, they, they feel that they're only sort of one disaster away from going off the rails, even though they may be employed, fully employed, working 40 plus, probably more hours a week. And uh, it's, it's that sort of unprotected and, and, and losers in globalization. These are, peop these are people, the winners are people like, you know, uh, me, uh, um, most people in this room, uh, people who are in, in, in sort of secure employment, uh, uh, people who uh, are in communities that are connected with the world like we are here, um, people who, uh, uh, and even, even migrants, right? They're winners of the globalization. They're move, being able to move to, to different places. People who um, sort of are, 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 are seen or are sort of protected in a, in a, in a world where we think differently about protected classes, and I'm not going to go into the HB2 thing, but, but rather than people who feel like, you know, the 1950s was the kind of world where uh, they would have prospered, and, 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 and things have changed greatly. This is real quick, because uh, how much time have I got left? Okay. Um, uh, what else about Trump? See, the first half of this talk was so well organized, the second half isn't. Uh, what else about Trump? Um, Trump's a double-edged sword. Mark mentioned it, hello, President uh, Clinton, and I think that's true, but I think for down, in down-ballot races, for down-ballot re Republicans, Trump is a double-edged sword because if he runs, there are, I think, going to be negative um, uh, forces, uh, factors working down the ballot for down-ballot Republicans. But at the same time, donors are just going to abandon Trump, and there's going to be a lot of the money that would be sucked up by a Republican presidential candidate will be will go further down the ballot uh, to um, uh, vulnerable Republicans uh, in congressional and gubernatorial races. So I think it could be a double-edged sword for Republicans. Um, one last thing. Will, uh, uh, this is, I don't know if this is a question. Will Trump be the nominee? Was that a question? It can be. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, you know, this week has been a really bad week for Trump. Um, and I think there's some real question as to whether he can win on the first ballot. And by the way, I don't think he'll be the nominee if he can't win on the first ballot. And there's tremendous work going on now convincing delegates that once you, after the first ballot, uh, you need to not vote for Trump. And, and, and the delegate selection process is being really um, influenced by this. Uh, if, he, if he gets, you know, if he doesn't, if he gets with, uh, within 100 or so, it's going to be an interesting question. But if it goes to an open, uh, a, 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 an open convention, um, it, you know, I don't know who will be the nominee. Uh, you know, obviously th there are some rules that need to be changed in order to put a nominee who is not Cruz on the ballot. We could talk about that in Q&A. Um, the, the, the final thing I, I was going to say is, but don't count Trump out. The states that are left, even though he's had a disastrous week and his numbers are tanking, particularly in Wisconsin, the, the landscape that's left helps Trump. Uh, he, do, he polls particularly well, of course, in New York and Pennsylvania and California. Those are the three big states left. And with winner-take-all or winner-take-most delegations, he could still get the 60% of delegates he needs to, to be the nominee. All right. That's my example.
Thank you. And our next uh, pundit is Rob Christensen with the Raleigh News Observer. He's their chief political writer, though just announced he's taking six months off to finish his uh, book on the Scott family. He wrote another book on the history of North Carolina as well. Everybody, Rob Christensen. Well, sorry to be late. I got hung up in the traffic. Um, well, last September, I sat down with Haley Barber, who is the former governor of Mississippi and former Republican chairman, who's one of the smarter people about politics. And I asked him, uh, who was likely to be the Republican nominee for president? This is last September. And, he, and this is what he says. He says, anybody who tells you they know who is going to win the Republican nomination will lie to you about other things. <laughs> so to paraphrase Haley, anybody who knows uh, what's going to happen in November will lie to you about other things. So, mu so much for... Uh, for, the, uh, for, for these uh, predictions. But I came into this election cycle with some preconceived notions. First of all, I thought that it was going to be a Republican election year because A, after eight years of Democratic, pre uh, Democratic administration, it, usually voters want to change the page. So I thought it was likely going to be a Republican uh, presidential year. And I thought, and in fact, and still think that if the Repub Republicans had put forward a, a fairly generic ticket of, say, Jeb Bush and John Kasich, they would have waltzed right into the White House. And I also thought that would help the down ballot, help Republicans down the ballot. So uh, I don't think that uh, Pat McCrory is a particularly strong governor, but with an economy recovering, I thought, and with a strong national public ticket, I thought well, he would be reelected. And I think Richard Burr was in, a, in all, it was an equally strong position. So I thought, going, coming in this election year, I thought the Republicans were looking pretty good. But as we know, things didn't turn out uh, as, we, uh, ha as, we, as we anticipated. And I think, and I think the reason why is probably one of the most, and we just touched on, Annie just touched on this, is I think it's one of the most underreported phenomena in, in terms of uh, uh, the newspapers and TV, and that is the decline of the white working class, basically, you know, just put it out there. And, uh, and it has been, and we see it in North Carolina, with you, you go outside the triangle to any small town and you go to Hickory or Lenore or any other place and you see the closed plant gates. And not only the loss of jobs, but it, there is a domino effect. So if you look at any kind of statistic, you see that people's lives are really going down the toilet. Uh, in a lot of these rural areas. So you see it in, in divorce rates, you see it in these, uh, the use of these illegal drugs, you see it in, in, in out of wedlock births, you see it, uh, you see it in uh, the decline of church attendance. Every good statistic is going down and every bad statistic is going up. People, the communities are coming apart. And so this is just giving these p people a real sense of, uh, of, uh, of despair. And, and we in the news media have not, uh, and this is not just, didn't just start today or this year or even five years ago, but it's been going on. It's been like a steady erosion of what's going on in America. And it's not North Carolina, just North Carolina. It's going on in the wet rust belt. It's going on all, all across the country. And, and, the, and the, the jobs that have disappeared have, uh, and, the, and the replacement jobs have not been nearly as good. And what we're seeing now are finally the political results of that. Uh, and, uh, and, and, that's, and that's what's happening here. Uh, and so normally you would say, well, if people, uh, and the Republican Party has not basically uh, uh, been responsive to these people's needs, and, they, and these people are not basically willing to give the Democratic Party to try because they don't trust the Democratic Party. So they're going, looking for other answers, and Donald Trump is one of those, those answers. I think Donald Trump is likely to be the Republican nominee, and if he's not the Republican nominee, he's likely to be a third party candidate. So it, it, we have the same issue. No, Trump is going to be a huge factor in the fall, whether he's a Republican nominee or a third party candidate. And that, I think, is very bad news for the Republicans, because it means that Hillary Clinton, who is a very poor candidate and who is the wrong candidate for the Democrats this year because people want, do want to change the page, and she is, yes. She's, she's not a very inspirational candidate, and she represents the past. But even so, she's likely to be the, elect, the new the next president of the United States by default. Uh, and and I think also, given that North Carolina is is one of those tipping states, you know, it was the Obama's closest victory in 2008. It was Romney's closest victory in 2012. I think it's state likely to go for Hillary uh, in in, uh, in November. And what does that mean? It means it probably shaves off a couple points off all the Republican candidates. 
So what does that mean? It means it means it's a very dangerous time for Pat McCrory, who's probably already faced a very close uh, uh, re-election campaign against Roy Cooper, and it means that, so he is in, he is in jeopardy. It means uh, somebody like Dan Forrest, who had a very close race last time, he's probably in jeopardy. It means some Republican Council of State candidates are probably in jeopardy, a very close race. Richard Burr, well, he probably he probably uh, the Democrats don't have a really strong candidate. They, they don't they don't have a Kay Hagan, or they don't they don't have the the former Charlotte mayor, so they don't have the, their, their A, A team in there. So he probably survives, because he probably has more than a couple. Uh, but but his pro he has a little bit of a problem is that he's not very well known. He doesn't have a strong identity. So he could possibly be in jeopardy, but probably not. He's a little bit like Hagen, is that he is a little bit of, since people don't have a strong way identified with him, he's like a cork that's sort of uh, in the ocean and that his prospects go up as the Republican Party's prospects go up and his prospects go down as the Republican Party goes down because he's almost a generic candidate. That was Hagan's problems. People didn't know very much about Hagan, so when the Democrats were up, she was up, and the Democrats were down, she was down, and, and the Democrats went down in the last couple weeks' campaign, she lost. So probably Burr survives, uh, but McCrory and Forrest and some other Republicans or anybody who's in a close race are, are at risk in, this, in the Republican thing. Uh, one last point, uh, HB2, uh, uh, I think this is, uh, this legislation, it'd be interesting to see how this plays out. I think this is, in my view, this is right out of the Republican Party playbook. Uh, all you have to do is look at the fact that in the, in the, in the, in the primary, uh, this last past primary, if you look at the, at the, uh, uh, at the uh, exit polls, six of ten Republican voters uh, are self-identified evangelicals. So this was an effort to, to one, uh, to, uh, to uh, energize the Republican base, which are largely or a majority evangelicals, to turn them out in an election that they may not be too excited. And B, it's a way to, uh, to, to, uh, to go after the Democratic Party candidates, particularly Roy Cooper, and portray them as outside the political mainstream because it forces Cooper to to because if he, as a Democrat he has to, to defend the other and he, he has, he's going to be painted as mainstream. We've seen this kind of issues before and it's sort of different and di di framed slightly differently. So I uh, have one of the values of having been around for a while in 1984. We, for example, uh, there were all billboards and and fun rate and letters and so forth portraying Jim Hunt as a friend of of, of gay rights and and of gay laws. In 1990, when Dem Harvey Gantt was a Democratic Senate candidate, there were all these TV advertisements uh, uh, saying uh, that, quote, Gantt has raised thousands of dollars in gay and lesbian bars in San Francisco, uh, New York, and Washington. Harvey Gantt has pr uh, pr uh, promised to bring back mandatory gay rights laws. So uh, th now this, these are not exactly the same thing, but the same sort of issues, the, the same reason. A, you you, uh, you 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 uh, you 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 stimulate your the conservative evangelical base, which is important for turnout, and two, you portray your opponent as somebody who's outside the political mainstream. He ain't like us, in other words. So, uh, so this actually, uh, while the Republicans are getting a lot of taking a lot of heat on this sort of thing, it actually, and you can question whether it's good public policy. It may actually be good politics. It may actually work for Republicans in the fall. So um, anyway, those are some of my thoughts. Thank you. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNCTV network.